uh, in chapter 7, we're going to talk about stereochemistry. If you recall, I told you we're going to cover stereochemistry before we go into any reactions, particularly the substitution reactions. Because stereochemistry is a very important concept uh, when we are talking about substitution reactions. We start with a very important uh, definition, which is the definition of uh, chirality. We say a molecule, and for that matter, an object, is chiral if the molecule is not superimposable over its mirror image. So I'm going to take the molecule or the object. I put it in front of a mirror. I'm going to get its mirror image. And then I take that mirror image and the object or the mirror image of the molecule and the molecule, and I try to superimpose them on each other. If they are not superimposable, then we say the molecule is chiral or the object is uh, chiral. If they are not superimposable, they are chiral. If they are superimposable, then the molecule is uh, achiral, not chiral. Or the object is uh, achiral or uh, not chiral. The simplest example is your hand. If you put your right hand in front of a mirror, the mirror image of your right hand is your left hand. The mirror image of your right hand is your left hand. If you try to superimpose them, you're not able to superimpose your hand over each other. And therefore, your hand is chiral. Now, of course, we're not going to do that exercise in uh, organic chemistry. We take a molecule, and then we put it in front of a mirror, and we rotate the molecule and try to put the molecule on top of its mirror image and find out whether they will overlap or not. We're not going to do that. There will be um, very easy uh, tricks to find out whether the molecule or the object is chiral or not. Now, let's look at uh, a very simple molecule, which is uh, bromochlorofluoromethane. So I'm going to do this exercise of taking that molecule, put it in, top, in, in front of a mirror. I will have the mirror image. So I'm going to put a mirror now. Would you all agree that uh, if I have a mirror here, the mirror image of uh, this molecule would be this molecule? I will have a hydrogen in the front, bromo to the back and to the right, and chlorine to the back and to the left, and fluorine is down and little to the back. Now what I'm going to do, so this is a mirror image. This molecule is a mirror image of this molecule. What I'm going to do right now, I'm going to rotate this 180, and I will try to superimpose the two molecules. Rotating this in 180 degrees, I will get uh, this. Uh, three-dimensional shape. Now I'm going to take this and put it on top of this one. What do I get? I get the hydrogen to be over uh, hydrogen, fluorine over fluorine, chlorine over bromine, and bromine over chlorine. So these two mirror image molecules are not uh, superimposable. Therefore, we conclude that bromo chloro fluoro methane is chiral. The molecule and its mirror image are not superimposable. Another way to look at the molecule, we can uh, uh, look at it in uh, this direction. I have the mirror. That will be the mirror image. Putting uh, this molecule on top of this one, I will get the red on top of green, the green on top of red the yellowish on top of yellowish, and the whitish on top of whitish, or the gray over gray. So they are not uh, superimposable. These two molecules are mirror images, and they are not uh, superimposable. We call them enantiomers. Enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror uh, images. Therefore, we are going to modify our original slide uh, about isomers. We defined isomers as what? What was the general definition of isomer? Same molecular formula, but they are different compounds. Different compounds, right? Under isomers, we have constitutional isomers, 
What is constitutional isomer? Branching, different skeleton. So you have different skeleton. And then we modified under isomers, we have stereoisomers. We said that stereoisomers, they have the same connectivity. What's different between one stereoisomer and the other stereoisomer is what? The three dimensional shape. The arrangement of atoms or uh, groups in space. Now under stereoisomers, now I have enantiomers. Enantiomers are stereoisomers that are non-superimposable mirror images. So enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. Now if you have two structures that are not enantiomers, but they have the same connectivity, and they have different arrangement of atoms and groups in space, we call these uh, diastereomers. So diastereomers are stereoisomers that are not uh, enantiomers. They are stereoisomers that are not enantiomers. Of course, this is going to be very easy next lecture when we find out the relations between molecules. Are they enantiomers? Are they diastereomers? Are they the same compound? It's very easy. So enantiomers and diastereomers, they are stereoisomers. They have the same connectivity. They have different arrangement in space. <coughs> Excuse me. Enantiomers, they are non-superimposable mirror images. They are stereomers. They are stereoisomers that are not uh, enantiomers. Now, let's look at chlorodifluoromethane and find out whether this molecule is chiral or uh, not. Well, if I look at the mirror image, I will get this molecule. If I take this molecule and I, I, I put it on top of this molecule, I will get uh, every atom to be superimposable over itself. Therefore, this molecule and its mirror image are superimposable. The molecule is uh, a chiral. <coughs> now, if you have uh, a carbon atom that has four different groups or atoms around it, that carbon is uh, chiral. I am referring to the chirality of the carbon. So if I have a carbon with four different groups or four different atoms around it, then the carbon is chiral. I can also call it asymmetric center, stereocenter, and stereogenic center. All of these four uh, different names are uh, symbolizing the same thing. You have a chiral center. Fine. If I am looking at this molecule, I have carbon bonded to a hydrogen, bromo, chlorine, fluorine. Four different atoms. Therefore, this carbon is chiral. If I am looking at this molecule, this carbon is chiral. Because the carbon is bonded to hydrogen, CH3, OH, CH2, CH3. Do you think this carbon is chiral? Why not? Because you have two hydrogens. You don't... Uh, uh, you don't need to have an oxygen and bromo and fluorine and different atoms so that you uh, get a carbon that is chiral. You can have a carbon to be chiral by simply being attached to four different alkyl groups. For instance, in this example, you have the carbon to be bonded to CH3, CH2, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, and then a butyl group. So you have four different alkyl groups. I, uh, how many chiral centers do we have in this example? I'm sorry? Ten? How many chiral centers? One. You have? One? Two. Okay, I heard two. Uh, ignore the title it is stating that you have one chirality center because that title could be wrong. None. Now tell me where are the two chiral centers? None. None. This one? Okay, we'll get to that one. Where is your second chiral carbon? Next, next to it? And why is this carbon chiral? 
OH, CH3, and you have this group, CH double bond, CH2, and this group. Would you all agree that this carbon is chiral? Yes. yes. Now what about this carbon? Why is it chiral? You said you have two chiral carbons and this is your second chiral carbon. Why? You change your mind? Yes. Why is it not chiral? Because it has a double bond. So? Because you don't have four different groups. You have three different groups. Okay? You have a carbon, a hydrogen, and this group. And the same applies here, around this carbon. You have three different groups, not four different groups. You need four different groups so that the carbon will be chiral. Another example. If I am uh, looking at the 1,2 epoxy propane, where is my chiral center here? This carbon. Why? It is bonded to hydrogen. It is bonded to CH3, it is bonded to oxygen, CH2, and it is bonded to CH2O. So it is bonded to four different groups. Therefore, this carbon is uh, chiral. Fine. How many chiral centers do I have in this compound? None. One. Okay, you said one. Tell me why. It is attached to four different groups. That is first group. That is the second group. But then, this group is the same as this group. So this carbon is not chiral. What about uh, this compound? How many chiral centers do you have? One. Where is that? This carbon. Fine. What about this one? Do you have chiral center here? Yes, you do. This carbon. You have this direction, different from this direction, and you have CH3 and H. What about this one? Yes, it is still chiral. What about this one? No. OK? So you need to have four different groups around the carbon. If you have four different groups, then you get uh, the compound, the, the carbon to be chiral. Yes, ma'am. Which one? Now, no, it's not. Yeah. Before it was, before I start putting the CH3 groups. It was chiral, yes. Here is another example. Yes. If it's not a ring, we only consider the one next to it. You need to have four different groups. For example, here in a ring, we consider all the yeah, well, this carbon is different from this carbon. You can stop right there. CH3, hydrogen, and this group, and this group. Yeah, that is a group. Right here, this carbon is chiral. Why? Because it is bonded to hydrogen, to this group, to this group, and to this group. This is limonene. You can have uh, isotopes to be bonded to the carbon. If you have different isotopes to be bonded to a carbon, for instance, in this example, you have hydrogen, deuterium, tritium, and CH3. That carbon is chiral. It is attached to four different groups, even if these groups are just uh, isotopes of uh, an atom. In this case, they are isotope of, uh, isotopes of hydrogen. A molecule with a single chirality center is definitely chiral. 
So we, we already established how to find whether a carbon is chiral or not. Now we are talking about the chirality of a molecule. If a molecule has one chiral center, then the molecule is chiral. If the molecule has more than one chiral center, the molecule may be chiral or not. So if you have only one chiral center, the molecule is definitely chiral. If you have more than one chiral center, the molecule may be chiral or a chiral. Tell me, is this molecule chiral? This molecule? No. You don't have any chirality centers. What about this molecule? Is this molecule chiral? Yes. yes, it has one chiral center. If you had, if you have in the molecule more than one chiral center, then we cannot make a conclusion yet. We will make later. So this molecule is chiral because you have only one chiral center. What about this molecule? No, it's not chiral because you do not have any chirality centers. To find whether a molecule is chiral or not, you need to find whether the molecule has a plane of symmetry or a center of symmetry. If it has a plane of symmetry or a center of symmetry, then the molecule is a chiral. Or for that matter, the object is a chiral. If you have a plane of symmetry, you the object is a chiral. If there is no plane of symmetry, the object or the molecule is chiral. Is, is a soccer ball chiral? No, it has a center of symmetry and plane of symmetry. What about the chair you're sitting on? Is it chiral? Of course it's chiral. Where is the plane of symmetry? No, it's not. How can I, uh, it's not. Fine, let's cut it in half. No, and what exactly? What do you do about that one? No. If you take it out, then it will be chiral. Okay? So you need to look at the plane of symmetry, center of symmetry. If you do not have a plane of symmetry or the center of symmetry, the molecule is chiral. Uh, what about this table? The way it looks. Is it chiral or not? No, it's not. There is apparently, apparently. There is a plane of symmetry right here, right? It is, cutting at, it is cutting the table into two halves that are symmetrical to each other with respect to the plane. Fine. If we are looking at our molecule, which is a chlorodifluoromethane, there is a plane of symmetry in this molecule. That's why the molecule is achiral. Where is the plane of symmetry? It's right here. You can have... A plane of symmetry, which is the plane of the molecule itself. For instance, if you are looking at one bromo, one chloro, two fluoro, ethene, this molecule is a chiral. What is the plane of symmetry? It is the plane of the molecule itself. You can have a center of symmetry. The center of symmetry in this molecule is right in the middle. This uh, atom is symmetric to this atom with respect to the center of symmetry. This atom is uh, symmetric to this atom with respect to the center of symmetry. And these two atoms are symmetric, and these two atoms are symmetric with respect to the center of uh, symmetry. Now, we're going to talk about optical activity of uh, a substance. A molecule is optically active if it rotates the plane of polarized light. And for a molecule to show optical activity, the molecule must be chiral, and one enantiomer must be in excess of the other. So if you are observing optical activity, the molecule must be chiral. There's no question about it. And if you have a mixture of enantiomers, one enantiomer must be in excess of the other. Why? Because if, a one, if one enantiomer is rotating the plane of polarized light in one direction by a certain angle, which we will refer to the specific, the specific rotation of plus 40 degrees, the second enantiomer will rotate it by minus 40 degrees. If you have a 50-50 mixture between one enantiomer and the second enantiomer, 
there will be no rotation of plane polarized light. Because 50% of the enantiomer is rotating in the pos positive direction, the other 50 is rotating in the negative direction by the same amount. That means, if you do not observe optical activity, you should conclude that either the molecule is itself a chiral, or you have what? The same amount. A 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, which we will refer to as a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture is a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers. Fine. First, as you know, light has wave properties, so you have periodic increase and decrease in the amplitude of uh, wave. When we talk about optical activity, we will be hitting the molecule with light that has a wavelength of 589 nanometer. That is the D line of sodium. So you have a sodium lamp that you are irradiating your compound with. The optical activity is coming from the wavelength 589 nanometer. This is called the D line of sodium. As you know, light propagates into so many different directions. Now, if you are able to put a filter in front of the source of light so that the light is coming out of the filter in only one direction, in one plane, then we say that the light is polarized, plane polarized light. So before the filter, you have the light going into so many directions. After the filter, you are having the light to go into one direction. If you take that plane polarized light and you hit a molecule, so we are going to put a prism first. We're getting plane polarized light. Then we are going to take this plane polarized light and we are going to hit a molecule that is chiral. What will happen? The plane of polarized light will be rotated by an angle alpha. So if the molecule is chiral, it will rotate the plane of polarized light by an angle uh, alpha. This is the observed angle, the observed uh, rotation. How do we measure optical activity? We use a machine that is called the polarimeter. So it's a very simple, uh, very simple instrument. You have uh, a source of light, and then that means you have uh, the light going into so many directions. So you have unpolarized light. You put a filter. That will get the light to be associating into only one plane. So you have plane polarized light. In a sample tube, you are putting your sample, your uh, compound that you are trying to measure its optical activity. If the molecule that you have in the sample tube, if that molecule is chiral, this plane of polarized light will be rotated by an angle alpha that you will observe on the analyzer. Now, of course, this angle that you are observing it depends on the amount of material that you are putting in the sample tube. How much are you putting? It depends on the concentration of the molecule that you have in the tube. It also depends on the length of the tube. How long is the tube? So for that matter, there is a relation between a constant, which is called the specific rotation. It is an alpha between brackets. The specific rotation, alpha, it depends, uh, uh, it is a constant. The observed rotation, it depends on the length of the tube and the concentration. How are they related together? The specific rotation is equal 100 times alpha over CL. Alpha is the observed rotation. Alpha between brackets is the specific rotation. It is specific to one enantiomer. So if I have uh, one enantiomer, that is rotating by a specific rotation of 40 degrees, the second enantiomer will have what kind of specific rotation? Minus. Minus 40 degrees. Now, the length is in decimeters, and the concentration is in gram per 100 milliliter. Fine. So a mixture that has an equal quantities of enantiomers, we refer to that mixture as a racemic mixture. And that mixture does not rotate the plane of polarized light. Once again, if a molecule does not rotate the plane of polarized light, 
It's either that the molecule is achiral or you have a racemic mixture. Now, um, in medicinal chemistry, and I'm going to refer to that uh, later in this chapter, you could be synthesizing a compound and you are getting one enantiomer. That uh, could cure you. While the second enantiomer can kill you. So it will be very important to separate these two enantiomers. Now, of course, if the second enantiomer is harmless, there is no problem. And we're going to talk about some medicines where you are have a, having a mixture of enantiomers. One of them is harmless and the second one uh, has uh, an activity. So it is very important to separate enantiomers if one enantiomer is uh, harm or co can cause harm to your body. And that is a very tedious work. And I'm going to share with you later, probably in the next lecture or so, how do uh, people separate uh, a mixture of enantiomers. Even if you have 1% of that enantiomer, it is very hard work. For that reason, people refer what is called enantiomeric excess. Enantiomeric excess is the percentage of one enantiomer minus the percentage of the second enantiomer. And therefore, if you are talking about the optical activity, the percentage of optical activity, that is referred to as the enantiomeric excess. Now, uh, uh, relative configuration and absolute configurations. Relative configuration, it is simply comparing the arrangement of atoms of one compound with respect to each other. But the absolute configuration, it will tell you exactly where is every atom. And whenever we, um, starting today in fact, we are going to learn how to find the absolute configuration of any atom in three-dimension, in uh, three-dimensional shape. And it is a very easy process if we do it step by step as we will start doing today. This carbon, right? It is attached to OH, hydrogen, CH3 and CH double bond CH2. Fine? Now, we will learn later that if you add hydrogen and palladium to a C double bond C, that will convert the C double bond C into a C single bond C. Fine? Are you doing any reaction at the chiral center? No. The chiral center is still intact. You're not touching that chiral center. The specific rotation of this molecule is 33.2 degrees. It rotates the molecule in the positive direction, and it is 33.2. The relative configuration of this molecule is still the same. The three-dimensional shape of this molecule is not changed. Why? Because you are not touching the, the, the uh, ca carbon that is chiral. Now, the specific rotation of this molecule is 13.5. Does that mean that every uh, molecule that is rotating in the positive will rotate in the positive? The answer is absolutely not. What you know, and I keep saying that, the only thing that you know if one enantiomer is rotating in the positive direction, the second enantiomer is rotating in the minus direction. That's, that's it. You cannot know which one is rotating in the positive direction ahead of time. If you are looking at this molecule or its enantiomer, this is the enantiomer of this molecule, rotate this 180, you will see it is its mirror image. So if you take this enantiomer and you add hydrogen palladium and you will get uh, the C double bond C to be reduced into C single bond C, or you take this enantiomer to get this enantiomer, these two are enantiomers, these two are enantiomers, you cannot predict which one of these two is rotating in the positive, which one of these two is rotating in the positive. All you know, if this is rotating in the positive, this must be rotating in the negative. If this is rotating in the negative, this must be rotating in the positive. Right here, positive, that is negative. That's positive, that is negative. I did not say, if this is positive, this must be positive. Absolutely not. And here is an example. I have another reaction. Where is the chiral center in this molecule? This carbon, right? The carbon is attached to hydrogen, CH3, CH2OH, CH2CH3. 
We will learn in chapters 4 and 8 uh, about the mechanism of this uh, reaction. It is a substitution reaction. You are converting the OH into BR. This is rotating in the negative direction. This is rotating in the positive direction. So you cannot predict the sign of the specific uh, rotation of a molecule. If one enantiomer is rotating in the positive, the second is rotating in the negative. That's it as far as you know regarding enantiomers. Now how are we going to find the absolute configuration of uh, any uh, molecule or any chiral center, uh, particularly carbons, we will be talking about in 211. We will use the CIP rules. CIP is the kahn ingold prelog rules. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's say you have a chiral center here. Based on the colors, where is the chiral center? Which one is the chiral center? The one that I am holding, right? Because it is attached to four different colors, four different atoms, or four different groups. So you need to rank these. You rank them, of course you rank them according to a certain rule, which is a CIP rule. Basically, you rank them according to their atomic numbers. The higher atomic number has a higher priority. The lowest atomic number will have the lowest priority. So you need to rank these four groups according to their atomic numbers. Then you need to rotate the molecule in a way that the lowest priority group is away from you. Let's say the lowest priority group is this white ball, which is a hydrogen. From where I am standing, I am looking at the molecule from the wrong direction. From where you are sitting, you are looking at the molecule from the right direction. So you need to rank them. You need to orient the molecule so that the lowest priority group is away from you. And then you go from the highest priority to the lowest priority. If you are going clockwise from your direction, am I going clockwise or counterclockwise now? Clockwise, that will be an R. If I am going counterclockwise from highest priority to lowest priority, that will be an S. So you need to rank the substituents. You orient the molecule so that the lowest ranked substituent is away from you. And then if the order from the highest priority to the lowest priority is clockwise, that will be an R configuration. If it is counterclockwise, that will be an S configuration. Um, let's adopt uh, that the highest priority has a number one. The lowest priority has uh, number four. But we can adopt it differently. But let's adopt it in uh, organic one and in organic two that the highest priority has a number one. The important thing, you are going from highest priority to the lowest uh, priority. Let's practice. How do we rank? So what we're going to do right now, how do we rank uh, atoms? For instance, right here, I have this carbon to be bonded to carbon, hydrogen, fluorine, bromine. The highest atomic number is that of bromine. So that will have rank number one. Then fluorine, that will have uh, rank number two. Then carbon, that will be rank number three. And then hydrogen, that will be number uh, four. One. Okay. Now, let's look at this example. I have the carbon to be bonded to bromine, fluorine, CH2, CH3, CH3. So how do I decide about priority? The carbon is bonded to bromine, fluorine, carbon, carbon. Okay? Bromine is of higher atomic number than fluorine, so that will be one, that will be two. Highest priority, second in priority. Between these two groups, what I would do, this carbon is attached to a hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. This carbon is attached to carbon, hydrogen, 
hydrogen. I put the atoms between parentheses in decreasing order of atomic number. I have this hydrogen and this carbon. Is carbon of higher atomic number or lower atomic number? Higher. Therefore, this is uh, priority number three, and this is priority number four. Second example. I have bromine, fluorine, CH2, CH2OH, and I have the isopropyl group. Bromine, higher atomic number, then fluorine. Then I have carbon, carbon. I say this carbon is bonded to carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. This carbon is bonded to carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. This carbon is bonded to what? Carbon, carbon, hydrogen. So, carbon, 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 hydrogen, that must be priority number three. And this is priority number four. What about this example? Well, I have uh, C bonded to tertiary metal group. I have hydrogen. I have CH3. And I have CH2OH. Hydrogen, carbon, carbon, carbon. I established right away that hydrogen is number four, lowest in priority. Now this carbon is bonded to hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. This carbon is bonded to carbon, carbon, carbon. This carbon is bonded to oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Hydrogen, 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 that is number three. Between these two, I have oxygen, carbon. Therefore, this is priority number one. This is priority number two. The first atom. Okay, I do not add the atomic numbers. I don't say how many atomic numbers. Oxygen is of higher atomic number, that's it. Therefore, CH2OH is of higher priority than tertiary butyl. What if I have a double bond? A double bond, you deal with it that you have the atom to be bonded to the second atom twice. For instance, I have here C double bond OH, CH2OH. So this carbon is bonded to oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen. This atom is bonded to oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen. This is of higher priority because oxygen is of higher priority than hydrogen. Then, you orient the molecule so that you are having the lowest priority group is, uh, yeah, and you look at the molecule where the lowest priority group is away from you, and then going from the highest priority to the lowest priority. If you are going clockwise, that will be an R configuration. If you are going counterclockwise, that will be an S configuration. I'm going to stop right here, and we'll carry on uh, next time.